We are ready, and you? Oui, oui, nous sommes okay. aussi. Nous sommes. Très bien. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce the last talk of, uh, of Lucy for uh, this uh, week. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, okay. please, Lucy. Yes, okay. So in the first two courses, I introduced the notion of real structures of complex varieties and the equivariant version with a group action of a reductive group. And we looked at some cases where we had um, interesting phenomenon that happened, but we didn't try to classify all the real structures because the automorphism groups were just too big and too uh, uh, unwieldy. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is talk about uh, uh, another aspect of this uh, study where we, the goal is to give a complete classification of equivariant real structures. And it's in the case where X is an almost homogeneous space. I spoke a little bit about homogeneous the last time. I will re recall that and then go on to the almost homogeneous space. So I'll start with uh, giving some, some definitions of the objects and then uh, um, go on to explain how we can study the objects. So for me, the group will always be a reductive complex group. And a, such a group always contains B, a Borel subgroup. If you don't know what a Borel subgroup is, it's not uh, serious because I'm just going to give one example. But the definition of a Borel subgroup is a maximal uh, uh, so solvable connected subgroup. So the case that will interest me will be G is SL2 and B are, I will choose the lower triangular matrices. That's a typical case of a Borel subgroup of a reductive group. One can also take uh, an algebraic torus, C star n, which is a, itself solvable there. And so in that case, if, if I take a uh, C star here, and then B is the whole group. This is torus actions. So um, what uh, I'll just give some now uh, definitions of what I mean by almost homogeneous. If X is a G variety, just a, a complex variety with a G action on it. First thing I will define, I'll say that X is almost homogeneous. If it is normal, and has an open orbit. So basically, I take a homogeneous space, and I try to add other orbits to it. And I want the singularities not to be too bad. Okay? And second thing I will define the complexity of a G variety. The complexity of X is the minimal co-dimension of a B orbit. So almost homogeneous says the, there's a uh, G orbit that's open. So the, but what about a B orbit? Okay. And thirdly, X is called spherical if the complexity is zero. 
Let me make sure that I'm not skipping things. So um, a spherical variety has an open B orbit, therefore an open G orbit. So a spherical variety is always almost homogeneous. Okay? And examples of almost homogeneous varieties are toric varieties. flag varieties, symmetric varieties, and there are many others. And spherical varieties uh, have been studied as a generalization of toric varieties for quite some time. Uh, and I will be telling you about this case. Um, if we go. Now, if you want to do classification of spherical varieties or of other varieties, let's go back to the, the first case of toric varieties. For toric varieties are just um, toric varieties are just almost homogeneous. C star n varieties. And they can be classified by combinatorial objects that are called fans. Um, now, that's one case of a kind of classification of over the complex numbers of almost homogeneous varieties. And in the same vein, in the 1980s, so 1983, Luna and Wurst uh, uh, developed a theory that generalizes this classification of toric varieties that is works for complexity zero and one, or complex classification of complexity zero and one, almost homogeneous varieties. In a similar way to the toric varieties, I will talk about that in just a moment. Uh, and just to give some uh, structure, then Timashev in the 1990s gave a generalization of this Luna Wust description that works over all algebraically closed fields, so not only complex, and also not only almost homogeneous, just complexity 0 and 1. So it's just a generalization. Okay? Uh, and um, so this is this, for algebraically closed cases, we have in complexity 0 and 1 some kind of combinatorial description. So the question that we will be studying here, or the problem, is classify uh, complexity, oh wait, compl classify real structures, all real structures. on these objects. Okay. I first will just give a list of uh, people who have been working on this approach of 
in some setting. Since the, yeah, for about, let's say, 15 years, people have been working on the spherical case. And complexity one is a little bit more uh, newer. For spherical varieties, um, there is work done by Uruguay uh, in 2012, Redhorn, Kupit Futu, and she with um, let me put all the names down, Arkizer and Timashev also. Borovoy and Gagliardi uh, did a very systematic study of spherical varieties, very general over any perfect field. This is probably the most general result for spherical varieties. Now I'll put um, Ronan Terpero and myself in the middle because we did both complexity. We study both the complexity zero and complexity one case. And in complexity one, something that I'm going to talk about a case today. Uh, uh, there's Moulin who's a student of Tepero and myself, who I will talk about what he did in complexity one. And there's also Kevin Longlois and Gilard, who studied not almost homogeneous complexity one variety, but com no, toric, um, torus actions. So torus actions of complexity one that are not almost homogeneous. So all of these uh, studies were, are it's somehow trying to understand the structure of these spherical and complexity one varieties. Okay, so I'm going to start by explaining what is the strategy of doing this uh, this classification. Um, so the, this, the strategy, without, f f I'm going to start by not explaining too much about Luna Vist. I'm just going to say the goal, the, the way we do this work is to take a complexity zero or one almost homogeneous variety look at its classification by Luna Wust, and then try to add some combinatorics to it to say what are the real forms. Okay. That will be how we will do this thing. But before I do this, let's see how we're going to do it. So I'm going to take x to be uh, almost homogeneous. Uh, uh, G variety with open orbit a homogeneous space G minus H. What am I going to do? I'm going to take, I'm going to fix a real structure. sigma on G. And I'm going to start by looking for, find real structures, G sigma structures, on the homogeneous space. So this we talked about how to do this the last time, but I'll repeat. 
how do you, how do you do this? Is I need to have a mu that is an involution here that is compatible with sigma, and the way I do that is I simply define mu g of h. So that is of the form sigma g. Mu of h will be something of the form kh, where k has to satisfy the homological uh, condition, which is simply that sigma h has to be kh, k minus, minus 1. And sigma k, k has to belong to h. This is what we have to remember. This is a condition on the homogeneous space. So that's my first step. And then what do I do with it? I want to know about all real structures on x. Well, a real structure on x will give me a real structure here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to decide if this real structure on the, open, on, on the, on the orbit, on this open orbit, extends. Okay. Okay. Fix mu. Decide if mu extends to a real structure on X. And the way I will do that. Well, well, I'll look at the, I'll, okay. I'll give the Lunavust classification of X. It's combinatorial. I'll explain to you how, where it comes from in a moment. And then define uh, an action of the Galois group. On this class, on uh, on the object, on the combinatorics, in such a way that mu extends, if and only if the action preserves the combinatorics. Okay. That's the goal. Okay. Okay. This idea of using an action of Galois group comes from Uruguay, who did it for the torus actions, for the toric case. And then when I, he also looked at it for spherical, but it has to be adapted a little bit for the complexity one case. So before, before telling you more about it, I think what I'd like to do is give you uh, some examples, so, which maybe will help understand the theory. This is good. So I'm going to look today for us at a special case where G is SL2 and H is a finite cyclic group. If H is finite and not cyclic, it can be done too. It's a little easier, in fact, but I'll look at the cyclic case here. Okay. So I'm going to, so G modulo H is going to be inside X, which is a G variety. SL2 is dimension 3. G over H is dimension 3. So X, the dimen dimension of 3 is X is, is 3. So it's a 3-fold variety with an SL2 action having an open orbit. Okay. Now, uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, I can give a whole classification, but I'm going to start by looking at minimal models. I'm going to say that X is a minimal model if first X is smooth and X 
is not the blow up of some other uh, almost homogeneous variety. It's as small as it can get. It's a minimal model. Okay. Um, Moulin, in a recent preprint, gave a classification of all real forms, real structures, real forms, real structures and forms, and forms in this setting. <coughs> and it's, uh, yeah, okay. One of the things that he found as a consequence is that a real structure or a real form will always either be with fixed points sets empty or real form is rational. And he did this just by a case by case study. And it's one of the questions that we have, is that an accident? Is it because just for this case or is it always the case? For the moment, we just have this one case where this is okay, where this happens. Okay. So, so X is uh, projective? Uh, in, in this is case, well, it, it doesn't have to be, but it will be. In all my examples, it will be projective. Here, oh yeah, I should say smooth. Okay. I would have said complete, but I'll put projective. It's, it saves me a little trouble. And does the classification depend on, on X, on the choice of X? Or yes. Only on no, it, it depends on H, it depends on X, it depends on everything. <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to just do, look at two examples, and then I'm going to go back and explain to you a little bit how the classification is done. So the two examples I will give will be with the finite subgroups as easy as I can. I'm going to do a trivial one and a plus or minus one. Okay. I'll do two examples. So G is SL2. And R N will be the irreducible uh, G module of dimension n plus one. In other words, Rn is just the set of polynomials, homogeneous polynomials of degree n in two variables. SL2 acts on that and it's dimension n plus one. Okay, So that gives me a uh, uh, variety with a G action. And the two examples I'm going to pick, one will be X, will be projective, let's put it in the right order, R0 plus R1. And the other will be uh, X is P, R1 cubed. Uh -huh. This one has an open orbit that's SL2. This one has an orbit that's P SL2. Because plus or minus one acts trivially on everything. Okay. Um, oh, I should have said one other thing that I uh, that th this classification, if you without real structures, if you want to look at all the minimal models, they have been classified, and they were classified combinatorically by, by Bousquet, a geometrically by Nakano. And what Moulin does, he looked at these classifications, and he, looked, he could do all the tests of what happens by looking at these classifications that were done uh, in the 1980s and 90s. Uh -huh. Okay. 
so these are the two examples I'll look. And before looking at, at the first one, I just want to do one small example of a homogeneous case. Right? OK, yeah, I'm here. this is where I am. So I'm, I'm not going to erase this yet, because I want to remember this. Let me do a preliminary homogeneous case. I'm going to take u to be a unipotent subgroup of g. And I'm going to look at g over u. It's a homogeneous variety. And, well, SL2 has two real form, real structures as a group. Sigma S of G is G bar, and sigma C of G is G bar inverse uh, transpose. And I can ask, OK, I take, I take sigma S, and I take this homogeneous form, and I say, does it have a homogeneous, uh, does it have a real structure? Well, what I notice is that sigma s of u is u. So that's easy. It has a, I can, uh, we, we can choose. So, so uh, uh, g over u has a g sigma s structure that's just mu s of g is g bar. Nothing changes. But if I look at sigma c of u, sigma c of u is not u, it's u transpose. And if I try to find a k that sends one to the other, I can show that it cannot be done. Oh, OK, so I'll just do this very quickly. Suppose that, um, well, I'll do it in the next slide. I'm trying to see, does there exist a K that does this, uh, that makes this change? Okay. We would have to have that uh, K U, K inverse would have to be U transpose and sigma C K k would have to belong to you. Okay, um, okay. What does it mean that k u, k inverse, is u transpose? That means that k is of the form 0, 1, minus 1, 0, something in you. If it's going to be this, it's going to, uh, in the, it's going to be in the normalizer view is the Borel subgroup, and then I have something like this. So uh, it would have to be of this form. And now if you calculate sigma c k k, you get in the first uh, first coordinate some something of the form minus something here. You cannot get one. So this does not belong to you. Cannot be done. Does it, can, uh, there, doesn't, there, there does not exist a real uh, G sigma C structure on G modulo U. On G modulo plus or minus U, there does, but not there. Okay. Okay, and this, I just wanted to do this 
first because now I'm going to go back to my example, the first example. And if I look at the, my first example, okay, okay. P R0 plus R1 plus P R1. I'm going to look at uh, my map from G to X. What's it going to do? I'm going to take A, B, C, D, and A, B, C, D. It goes to 1, A, C, B, D. Right. It's injective. This is uh, almost homogeneous. It's got everything, all the properties we want. And if you look at it, this variety has five orbits. There's the open orbit. Two uh, dimension, no, two, two orbits of dimension one, each of them isomorphic to pi one. And then two surface, or, or no, uh, a surface, one. Um, one surface, oh, okay, orbit isomorphic to G modulo U, and another orbit isomorphic to G modulo the torus. Uh -huh. In particular, you see one orbit of this form. Now, suppose that there were a real structure on X which is compatible with sigma C. Well, what is sigma C going to do to this orbit? Well, either it's going to send it to another orbit, but the other orbit has to look like this and there isn't one, or it has to give you a real structure on this orbit, but there isn't one. So we can see in this way that there is no G sigma C structure on this variety. Okay. Is that clear? I have only one orbit of this type, and this type does not have a real structure for sigma C. Yes? This one? Yes, because my, coordinates, uh, I have a matrix of determinant one, A, B, C, D, and I send the first coordinate to it. I'll, this is in P2, right? One A, C, and the other B, D. OK. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. okay. This is in R0. This is R in R1. And this is in PR. Well, I'm, I'll just say for the sigma s, there is a unique one. And I take for sigma s, there is one. There exists a unique g sigma s structure. And its fixed point are what you think they would be. Uh, the fixed point set is just P2R cross P1R. Really no surprises in this case. Okay. You look at the fixed point sets of the two parts. Uh, so this is a circle and this is a projective to real two space non orientable. Let's look, now look at the second example. <coughs> cubed. I have PSL2 or G modulo 
plus or minus you know, when it, that injects into P1, R1, 3. It has an open orbit. You just take three different values there. You, you, you can take, for example, I just take the class of the identity, and I can send it to 1 infinity 1, for example. Uh -huh. And then I make it homogeneous. OK. Um, now, I don't want to do too much about this, but you can, it's easy to see the orbits here. Here, there's one that, well, there's one orbit of dimension 1, P1, that's the diagonal. P1, P1, up. Uh, R1 is two dimensional space. Oh, so, okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, okay. Ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. It's just a, uh, uh, it's just a projective line, All right? And the, 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 so, um, if I look at um, the there, there's the open orbit. There are three two-dimensional orbits, which I'll call S1, S2, and S3. And there's one one-dimensional orbit. I will just restrict, restrict for time's sake, just the case of sigma S, and look what happens for sigma S. OK, let's start by looking at, um, uh, at the at PSL2. One can show that for PSO2, there exists two G sigma S structures up to equivalence of PSL2. One is the standard one, and the other one is twisted a little bit. Right. Now, one can show also that my, this is x, x has two g sigma s structures. Well, you see this and you say, well, the two here extend. No, it's not that. What happens is that you can have two structures that are equivalent here, where they extend differently, and another that didn't extend. So I'm just going to tell you what happens in this case. I'm just going to write down um, I'm just going to write down some structures. On X, or on on the on PSL two, so I can write mu one GH is sigma GH, mu two GH is sigma G zero I H, mu three. The GH equals sigma G one minus two I zero one H. These are all S's here. And I could also do mu prime of GH is sigma G zero one minus one zero H. And what one can show just by uh, by an easy calculation, is that mu prime 
is not equivalent to these, but all of these are equivalent. And now I try to see what would extend. I find that um, mu1 extends and stabilizes the three orbits. S1, S2, and S3. Mu2 extends. It exchanges two orbits and stabilizes the third. And the other two don't extend. And so the two that come up there come from equivalent things in the moon, but that are different here. And if I look at the fixed point sets, I can see that the fixed point sets are really different for these varieties. Good. OK. So the fixed point sets in the one case, it's just p r1. P R. It's just S1 cross S1 cross S1 when they're all fixed. Or it can be P1R cross S2. This is coming from a real form of P1 cross P1, which changes to. So may maybe you wanted to write mu prime? Uh, mu prime does not extend. Does not extend. Mm -mm. But you, but you, this is from mu1 and mu2. How they can be equivalent and this have is, different. They're, they're equivalent on the open set, but they're not equivalent on x. That's what happens. The automorphism groups aren't the same. But the fixed point set is. This one on comes the, from mu1. And this one comes from mu2. On the open set, they're the same, but not on the whole thing. That's where one has to be careful. The automorphism group of x is contained in the automorphism group, but it's not the whole thing. OK, okay so I want to give these examples. And now, in the last uh, seven minutes, seven minutes, I will make a small description, very brief, of how this is done with the Lunavus theory. What? It doesn't extend. It doesn't extend. So you have, you, you can have three that are equivalent on the open set. Two of them extend, but differently, and one that doesn't extend. It's completely possible. That's what I wanted to show here with this example. So I'm going to just give a very brief description of the Lunavust theory. And it's based on a result. Well, Sumihiro did it for the torus, tori, but it's a little bit more general, that if you have a almost homogeneous variety x, and x is normal, what I can show is that every g orbit of x intersects a b-stable affine open uh, sub, uh, sub variety of x. This is the starting point for the classification of toric varieties, because what it says for toric varieties is that 
uh, all I need to do for toric varieties is look at affine toric varieties and then paste them together. Because for a toric variety, what this says is every, every g orbit is in an affine set. Mm -hmm. um, now, why is this interesting? This, because the idea of the Lune Auguste is describe, no, describe the local rings of orbit closures. I have x. It has a bunch of orbits. I'm going to look at all their orbits closures, and I'm going to look at their local rings. If I know all the local rings, I know x. Okay? And so I'm going to make a combinatorics that tells me how to classify these local rings. Okay? These local rings all have quotient field, the field of rational functions on GH. So I'm going to fix K okay, to be the field of rational functions on G modulo H. Um, now, I'm going to uh, uh, look at all B stable divisors prime divisors in X. B-stable prime divisors divide into two groups, either G-stable or not G-stable. Right. A G-stable divisor will give me, will come from a G-stable valuation ring. Uh, determine uh, uh, G-stable valuation ring. Valuation. And the not G-stable divisors that are B-stable correspond to B-stable divisors in the open set, and just closures. So the idea of, of the luna Vust classification is for each orbit, I'm going to define two objects, and I'll stop with, with, with that. Okay. VG is a set of all G-stable valuations on uh, G modulo H, on K. And DB is all B stable prime divisors on G modulo H. Nothing to do with X there. Right. And now to for for each orbit Y. In X, so I have this big X. I have, I have, you guys here. I'm going to look at all the divisors that are G-stable that intersect with it. Some will be G-stable. Some are B-stable and not them. And I'm going to look at those objects. I'm going to look at the um, VY. G is the valuations on VG such that the V is a valuation of a G-stable divisor on X containing Y.
and db y is db y is all the d and db such that d contains y as a divisor in x. So I can say d closure. And I claim that these subsets determine the orbit y. It tells me what the local ring is. Because the local ring is just going to be the intersection of all the local rings that contain it. And it's enough to check on the B-stable ones. That's the whole idea of Luna Boost. Okay. So the combinatorial data is the set of all these objects for all the y orbit in x. And so in order to get a real form, what I'm going to do, well, I won't do it here because it's getting late, but I'll explain how to do it. I'm going to define an action of the Galois group on these two ob objects. And then what I say is that, well, I can see if the set is preserved by that action, then the action, uh, can, uh, the, 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 the real form uh, can be extended. And if not, no. And so I'll just finish by saying, how do I define it? Well, there's a natural action on k. Gamma acts on k. What does gamma do to a function f to x? Well, I look at f of mu of x bar. Mu is given. I want to know if mu extends. So I look at any element of g modulo h. I have a natural action on the rational functions. I do it, and then I use this to define my action here. And the whole deal is to show that that uh, gives a good action such that I can tell when these things extend. Okay. Um, just to close, I will say that the two things to remember. One, it's a very um, delicate thing to remember that equivalences on the open set are not enough to consider. You have to look at all of them on the open set. And secondly, what we, what we would like to do is extend this theory not only for uh, real forms, but for any perfect field. It's the same thing. You just have to do it with a bigger Gallo group. OK, I'll stop there. Thank you. Are there any questions? The evaluations you consider here are uh, just the divisorial evaluations that uh, yeah they're geometric that, okay. so you, you basically they're 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 determined on what happens on the b semi invariants and that's where the complex I, I kind of hid there where the complexity comes in when the complexity is little there are few semi invariants and that's so, why you can do it okay, so you do not change models in a rational way so you do not uh, so you work on the minimal uh, no, I work on, I just look at all the valuations on a field. The field is always the same. Okay. So I, I'm f I fix the open set. I fix G modulo H. Yeah. That's given. And then I work on, look at all the different uh, ways of having almost homogeneous varieties with that as an open orbit. Okay, but still uh, divisorial uh, evaluation, not more general. Uh... You can have more general. Ah, so you can work also with can, the... Because you have these. These, yeah, they don't have to have, it's not only DV, it's the complement of the open orbit doesn't have to be a union of divisors. Okay. okay. Thank you. Other question? So on, on your previous example with mu1, mu1, mu3, yeah. 
So uh, the fixed point set uh, intersect the open orbit? Yes. Yes, so Always. they coincide on the open orbit. That's right. And you and complete in the it different. Compactification, That's right. The real uh, yes. part is different. Yes. Okay. That's right. And uh, in this uh, setting of uh, quasi homogeneous. Uh, yeah. Quasi homogeneous well, yeah. setting, uh, the, 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 the set of uh, real. Structure has some structure itself? Well, that's what we're looking at a little bit. This is why, uh, I mean, often it's empty, and then it's not that interesting. Ah. And when it isn't empty, well, that's where, where uh, um, Luca showed that they're always rational. Uh -huh. We're trying to really say what they are in all cases, but sometimes it's a little bit hard to say. But they. Uh, so we do not expect to have uh, some. Uh, I would love to see something else. I haven't. I don't know. What, I don't know what to find. I don't know. Okay. But you, you have to look in cases where it's not empty, and to, okay. to look for interesting things. And well, that what ha we have to do is SL two is too small of an example. We have to look at other complexity one examples. Okay. Thank you. And jo George, uh, do do you have any question or comment? Indeed, I think I have two two questions. Okay. Okay. So, in the in the first lecture, uh, you 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 mentioned that uh, you thought that the subject was very appropriate for the affiliation theory yes. community. Right. So, uh, we we discussed about the script the comment for a while in the discussion session, and what right. we conclude is that this is, seems to be a natural problem to look at in affiliation theory, of course, uh -huh. affiliation. Uh, but uh, do you have any other thing in mind? Do you have something else in mind? No, I, I think more of just looking at the orbit structures in these varieties and see what they look like and if they can be interesting. I, because you, you, well, especially when you look at the real, po real the, the points that are fixed, the fixed point sets. I mean, like in the examples I had, I have circle actions on R4 or you have uh, other kinds of, you, you can, in these examples, when it's almost homogeneous, I'm not so sure that's what you need. But having a group action on a variety and then looking at what the fixed point sets look like and how they, uh, how they intertwine, that's what I was thinking. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, then the second question somehow related, are you aware of any attempt of any work of applying the, uh, of studying the real forms of complex foliations or? No, I don't know of any. I think, I, I think that it would be a good thing to look into, but I don't know of any, no. no. Okay, thank you. Frank, I, 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 I think this is the, the last uh, joint activity that we had. Yes. That we have. I think it's a great moment to thank the, the speakers oh, yes. and the lecturers right. of the course. Uh, they did a wonderful job. I'm extremely happy with the, the, the mini course. I, I learned a lot. I think we all learn a lot. And uh, I think it's time to thank them for that. Yes, so thank you very much. And please and, and send, a, thing... send a bag of Buya Bath to us. What? Send a bag with the Buya Bath to us. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, thank you for the CIRM and IMPA to help us to organize this. So, at, at the first moment, they asked us to organize this, but I, I was maybe not uh, totally convinced at the beginning, but I think it was a very good experience. And uh, I would like to thank all the staff and Guillaume, who is uh, in his box, <laughs> and so on. So thank you. And we have to thank Anderson here also that spent a lot of time of, with us. He probably knows more about foliation theory than he <laughs> ever wanted. <laughs> Thank you.
So we uh, will uh, continue tomorrow uh, morning uh, with uh, we have four talks tomorrow morning. For, so for us, it is not totally the end of the of the adventure. Yeah, for for us, we we still have a discussion session, but that's it. We don't have uh, any uh -huh. activities tomorrow. Okay. So bye bye. Enjoy the the dinner, yeah, and in, enjoy the last day of conference. Okay, thank you, bye bye. Yeah, it